Good morning, everyone. This is a maybe unusual seminar today. So I have to I have to explain how this all happened. So I actually met Tommaso when several Helmholtz researchers were invited by German television to give pitches about their research. And Tommaso immediately caught my attention when he said that he had always been eager to explain quantum physics in Die Sendung mit der Maus, which is a German uh, kids television thingy. And I thought we really need this guy for our seminar uh, to explain quantum technologies for dummy, dummies, basically. Um, yeah, so who is Tommaso? He's the director of the Institute for Quantum Control of the Peter Grunberg Institute at Forschungszentrum Jülich and also professor of quantum information at the Institute of Theoretical Physics of the University of Cologne. Uh, initially, he received his PhD at the University of Ferreira before coming to Germany where he first was a postdoc at the University of Innsbruck and finally professor for physics at the University of Ulm in 2007, by the way. And I could report many highlights. Something that I found very interesting is that he has authored the Quantum Manifesto, which initiated the European Commission's Quantum Flagship Initiative, actually. And also a very recent achievement was that he was involved in launching the European Quantum Industry Consortium. So he's He's really worldwide one of the go-to persons for the, in this field, and uh, we're looking very much forward. I, I personally look very much forward to your talk. Thank you very much. It is wonderful uh, to be speaking uh, uh, to an audience, which of course is not at all dummies. I am very aware uh, of that, but of course, uh, non-specialists. So this is uh, why I am trying to give uh, a sense for people, of course, who um, have a scientific background, but no knowledge of quantum mechanics or for that matter, even physics, if you wish. I mean, what are the main aspects intuitively which, uh, you know, uh, involve us in this, um, which uh, we, we can engage with in this field, which uh, I personally find and many of my colleagues very, very exciting. And I will try to explain why. So <clears throat> this is the field of quantum technologies. And I would like to start by a little story. Uh, which is the following. Mm, well, when I was, and it was a long time ago, of course, unfortunately, it was, I think, uh, almost 25 years ago, uh, that I was in my second week as a postdoc in Innsbruck, as you mentioned. And so, um, well, I take my bike from the cellar, I wanted to go uh, home. Out of the cellar I come, in comes a black limousine. And out of the black limousine comes the Dalai Lama, which you can see here in this picture. You know, um, in the lab, in the cellar of my colleague Rainer Blatt, who is uh, uh, here with a, with a tie in the background. Here you can, you can read what uh, His Holiness wrote. I cannot translate that. I have no idea what, what, what it was. But what I can tell you is something that every one of us can probably relate to, which is uh, he wanted to do something which he had been taught in school is impossible. And as a matter of fact, also, I have been taught in school, it is impossible, and probably all of you the same, and even my children, as I found out, are being taught it is impossible, it is impossible to see a single atom. Actually, one of the inventors, the first developers of quantum mechanics, Erwin Schrödinger, said, it is ridiculous to imagine that you can make experiments with a single atom, you know? It is more ridiculous than thinking that you can raise a pterodactyl in a zoo. Now, no one knows why he chose the pterodactyl as opposed to something which is easier to pronounce, okay? But in any case, he meant, you know, it, it's impossible, you know? It, uh, I mean, it will never happen. And then, if you go to the lab of Rainer Blatt, there is this little trap, which you see here in the, in the small inset, and it is something, some electrodes, some metal parts, and they sit in a vacuum chamber, which is a, essentially a glass can, out of which you, <coughs> you take out all the, all the air with pumps, and you illuminate that with lasers. And between this and your eye, uh, there are only lenses, so it's really a microscope, but not like an electron microscope of some of these things which give you some image. No, no, no. You put your eye and you see this, you know? very tiny, very small, lonely in the darkness, but it is a single atom. And <clears throat> he wanted to see, experience that. And actually, I can tell you that <clears throat> uh, last week I was in, in Washington and in New York giving talks for, we had a celebration of the University of Cologne's uh, US office, and I met some artists uh, which gave a performance and we are collaborating with them on some project on quantum art. They work in art science, and one of them, uh, Evelina Domnich uh, told me that she was the week before 
in um, Zurich, in Winterthur, at the museum, and she took this picture, oh sorry, not this one, the other one, I will tell you what this, the, this other one is, so the second picture, sorry, the order is wrong, this is a picture she took with her cell phone, so with her iPhone, by putting her iPhone, you know, on top of this vacuum chamber, and those are three individual barium ions which sit in the museum, okay? And this is not a very high-tech lab, it's a museum, so there are children sort of climbing onto the structure, and if you put your cell phone there, or your eye for that matter, you can see individual atoms. Something which we have been taught is a Gedanken experiment, you know? This is a German word which is used also, as you know, all over the world, in my uh, time when I was studying uh, physics in Italy, okay, uh, my, our, our professor would say, e adesso vi dimostrerò questo Gedanken experiment. So it is a word in German because indeed the founding fathers of this came from Germany and they thought, you know, you cannot really make it. You can only think about it. Now you can. So what is in the other <coughs> picture? Actually, fast forward again. This is a picture that was taken yesterday. So this guy uh, uh, standing uh, in, in, uh, on the right of this picture is Dan Nika, he is a, a parliament member who is responsible, he is the rapporteur for the CHIPS Act, we had a meeting yesterday and we brought to him, it was non-trivial because you know security in, in the European Parliament is non-trivial, so getting this device through was kind of uh, not simple, in the end they were convinced because it is not functioning, because this device is a reproduction of the quantum computer and at the bottom there is the quantum chip which in Yulich is produced, we just hired a few months ago the head of the quantum lab from Google to make this with the superconducting technology and make this as a quantum computer in Yulich, which will be now connected to the supercomputer because like the supercomputer can do so much, can calculate very complex things and then on top of this we put the quantum computer so that we go beyond what any supercomputer can do. This is what we call quantum advantage. I will come back to that in a moment. But really, this initial slide for me is kind of still, when I look at it, it's kind of, I cannot believe that this is really happening. Because, you know, what was fundamental science of purely, if you wish, philosophical interest 25 years ago, now really is technology <clears throat> which you can use for practical purposes. And I want to give an intuition why that is the case. So, <clears throat> if we think what is standard technology which we all carry in our pockets. For instance, in my left pocket of my trousers, I had, I have this, this is a device similar to what all of you have. It is based on classical computing technology. Like there is a silicon chip there. If you look in 1947, what a transistor was, this was something which was about this big, you know, a couple of centimeters. Now we have, you know, uh, 70 years after, uh, we have actually very many of those, billions of those transistors integrated in a very tiny chip, okay? And there was, for several years, this Moore's law. It was predicted that every couple of years, the number of transistors on this chip would double by constant cost. This is actually no longer true, but was, for many years, the foundation of the first quantum revolution. So as a matter of fact, this device which I, I, I showed you, and you also carry in your pocket, is something which would be entirely impossible without understanding and mastering the laws of quantum mechanics. Because transistors, as well as lasers, which, you know, uh, um, feed optical fibers, which are the foundation for the internet, which is actually what is carrying this talk, you know, it is turned into zeros and ones, you know, in, in both in sound and, and, uh, and picture, and then it goes through the internet and it reaches you. Now I'm in Brussels, you are, you know, in different places in Germany and maybe not only. So this goes through optical fibers and it is driven by lasers, which very quickly, you know, are switched on and off. And each on and off is one zero. Those are the bits which are actually building, putting together the information that we exchange on the internet, for instance. So um, without quantum mechanics, that's my first point, this what we call the first quantum revolution would not be possible because you cannot build lasers, transistors, you know, computers unless you really master the laws of quantum mechanics. But there is a big but, which is this is as I, uh, it's written here based on bulk effects, meaning that for each zero and one, as I said, it's like switching on and off 
a laser field in the optical fiber, a current in some electrical or electronic circuit, and each time I switch on and off, there are very many photons, those are the quanta of light, the tiniest particle of light are called photons, and there are very many hundreds or thousands every time I switch on and off this laser in the optical fiber. There are very many hundreds and thousands of electrons every time in a small transistor I switch on and off those zeros and ones. So this is what is working until now. But now, you know, this scaling, like making it more and more powerful, which we experienced in the last several years, is coming to an end. This is the number of transistors predicted by Moore's law from 1970 to uh, almost today. And we see that, you know, it grows as it was predicted, uh, but actually it saturates. So at some point it is no longer becoming uh, more powerful. If you remember, until a few years ago, every couple of years, you would get a new processor, which would be, you know, like uh, uh, 500 megahertz, then one gigahertz, and then two gigahertz, and so on. So the frequency, the speed, the, the power of our processors was uh, uh, growing. This is no longer happening. So to have a more powerful computer or a supercomputer, you have to put many processors together. So you have to grow this by putting many processors. But as a matter of fact, each individual processor is no longer growing as it was predicted. So this Moore's law is kind of ending, but this could be, you know, a stimulus for going beyond that. And this is what we do with quantum technologies. So here is a slide, no formula, but just a slide to give an intuition. What are the most important aspects of those quantum bits? So what happens, in other words, when I combine bits with what the Dalai Lama saw in the lab in the cellar in Innsbruck? When I use individual quantum systems, an individual atom, an individual photon, I use them as bits, as quantum bits, as qubits, then two important things come up. And the first one is superposition, and the second one is entanglement. So superposition is depicted here. This is just a metaphor, because of course, I mean, this is you know a, a, a drawing, and a, an atom or a photon is nothing like this, but it is to give the intuition of the essential feature, which is this cube, which is represented on the left, uh, is you know at the same time you know contains the figure of face down and face up. So when you see it, it's like a transparent cube and your mind can interpret it when you observe it either like face down or like face up. In a way, when you observe this figure and you look at it uh, and you try to get, get a sense of what it is, then it will collapse in one of the two configurations. So a quantum bit is similar in that a quantum bit, an atom, can be at the same time in the position zero and one. An electron, those of you who are familiar maybe from the life sciences and from chemistry, electrons are in atoms, they are in orbitals, you know, this is something which you study when you study chemistry in the beginning, you know, S, P and so on, orbitals. <clears throat> so those are different possibilities for the atom to, you know, move around the nucleus of the atom. And then an electron can be at the same time in two of these possible configurations, similar to this cube, which can be both face down and face up. Now, with one quantum bit, one qubit, that's maybe interesting, but maybe not so much yet. I mean, what can you do with that? Not much. But no, if I start having more than this, then this is where it becomes interesting. Here's an example of two uh, <coughs> such cubes. And those are, you know, the, the, the um, uh, gray one and the orange one. They are correlated. What does it mean? That if you look at them and you try to interpret again, do the same thing, how are they in 3D, in three dimensions? Well, uh, you either see both of them face down or both of them face up. Actually, I do not know anybody who can, you can try, you can look at them. I do not know anybody who can end up seeing one down and the other up at the same time. It kind of switches. So <clears throat> this is a metaphor again, because quanta do not work like this, but it's a metaphor that if I have an entangled state, like I have more than one of these qubits, which is in such superposition, they can be correlated. What does it mean? That I look at one, and if it has been prepared in that state, I know that if I found the left one face down, also the right one will be face up, and uh, face down, or if it is face up, the other one will be face up, and this no matter how far apart they are. 
So I could take one of these uh, um, qubits, in this case, here in Brussels, where I am, and uh, the other one in Heidelberg, and then they would still maintain this correlation. So when I observe one, I instantly know what you will get when you observe yours. I can use this to do some things which maybe this would become a little bit more technical. You can do things like teleportation. I can try to explain a little bit if you have questions afterwards. But <clears throat> the idea is, oh, sorry, no, uh, okay, no, that comes later because I thought I had now a picture and I will come back to that later that you can actually take this entanglement really on very large scales. You can distribute it nowadays via satellites over thousands of kilometers. I will explain what you can do with that. Okay, but this is just to say, if I have individual atoms and I use them as bits, then via this superposition and entanglement superposition of many of them, I can get something which does not exist. It has no analog in the classical world. So <clears throat> how do we use that? This is really the basis of the second quantum revolution. And here we are manipulating and engineering individual quantum systems, individual photons, individual electrons, individual atoms and molecules. And we are going to enhance the computing power, the sensitivity, the speed, the security of a lot of information processing applications which are actually relevant for our everyday life even. So what I'm going to do in the, in the following slides is to give a flavor for some of these uh, applications. Yeah? Uh, I try not to go too fast because, I mean, uh, it's very important to keep it non-technical. So I would like to get, have a first control point at this point whether I am already maybe going too fast or whether somehow in order to get a, an approximate uh, kind of intuition what we are talking about, this is the right speed, because in this case I will go on and if in, in the hour that we have I will not manage to speak about everything, it doesn't matter, it's just to give a, 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 a first sense for what we are doing here. So can I get a, a first confirmation whether I'm already going too fast or whether kind of I have not, not lost too many of you in the, in the process now? Um, so I, I think it's I, a good pace, but maybe there's other, can you put a, I see some, some thumbs up and some green, uh, signs. So thank you. <clears throat> okay. So that's encouraging. Okay. No, no, I didn't want a, a sort of a, a full, but just a little bit of a, of a sense, especially if someone has objections and, or, or maybe there are already a couple of questions perhaps at this stage. Uh, maybe we can also do it like this so that uh, I get a sense. Any questions at this moment? possible that there are none okay let's let's go on like if it was a normal seminar and so <clears throat> here are is a summary of the areas in which now I will sort of describe how those quantum bits how do they make a difference and they make a difference in communication where we have the goal with our quantum flagship to go towards and also with Helmholtz quantum uh, <clears throat> the quantum initiative at, at our Helmholtz Association um, we are moving towards a quantum internet in which we have security Secure communications, I will explain why. Then we have simulation, development of new materials and maybe also new chemicals, new drugs, also relevant potentially for life sciences. Then another thing which is very relevant for life sciences is sensing. I will, I will mention to you, I will show you uh, a situation in which we can have individual neurons detected when they fire in real time by quantum sensors. Then there is quantum computing, which is maybe one aspect which is most known perhaps from, from the media. And then underlying all of this is basic science, the basis of all of that. So let's go a little bit into <clears throat> some of the applications. So here is quantum communication. So in particular, quantum cryptography is the art of encrypting, so making secret, encoding secret messages for securing data, financial data, and also, you know, things like uh, uh, um, power grids and so on. Here, what do we have on this slide? We have a picture of devices from different European companies which can be purchased. And actually, we are building an infrastructure based on these devices. So they are already commercially available. And <clears throat> this is something which can be really uh, also put on satellite you know, and put in orbit. This was a vision when Anton Seilinger, also in Innsbruck, uh, uh, 25 years ago, did for the first time teleportation based on quantum entanglement. He had the vision to bring it in space. 
And of course, the European Space Agency slept on it for the good part of the last 25 years. And in the meantime, other companies and other countries have actually done that. For instance, here is a picture of a quantum satellite which the Chinese government has put in orbit uh, a couple of years ago, you know, distributing quantum cryptography signals <clears throat> across thousands of kilometers. I will explain in a moment how that works. Of course, <clears throat> the Americans had it before the Chinese, but it is a dark program. So they also had a, a satellite in orbit before the Chinese. But of course, it is a dark program, so you cannot speak about that. So unfortunately, since we are on Zoom, I can now not kill all of you after I told you this secret. So you can now, you know, uh, happily go on and you know that this is the case. But of course, I, even if we met in person, I wouldn't have to kill you because I was told by someone who in turn didn't kill me and didn't sign anything for that. So this is something that, of course, you don't speak about officially, but it is kind of known in the community. And <clears throat> how does that work? That's the, the nice thing. So again, the main point of quantum technologies is I have individual particles. In this case, it's individual photons, one photon after the other. It is like a very, 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 very weak light. And those photons are individual particles which are transmitted. Many photons together make a light pulse or like uh, uh, what we, we see every day. But if it is very weak, we can have, and maybe we can even control, actually, those devices that I mentioned are indeed able to control and send one at a time. So here, the technical details are not important of this scheme. The point is that there is some transmission from Alice on the left to Bob on the right. And there are different possibilities for zero and one, different directions which they, uh, they can choose. Now, they can verify that the photons that Bob receives are in the same direction and with the same value, zero or one, which Alice sent. And they can be sure that no one has listened. Why? Because they send them in special states, <clears throat> which if an eavesdropper would know which state is being sent, then they could measure and then they could get the information. But if they don't know if this photon is sent with a direction like vertical or diagonal, when they measure, they disturb the system. So you can detect, you know, Alice sends a photon in zero and Bob gets it in one. And they say, no, wait a moment. There is a disturbance here. Someone was eavesdropping. If the National Science, uh, uh, sorry, National Security Agency in the US, as we know from the Snowden scandal, would be listening, if we send our bits with many photons, as I said before, they can just come. This is what actually happens. They take a couple of these photons per bit. We don't notice, but they know because if there are no photons, you know, then it means it was a zero. If there are a few photons, then it is a one. But if it was like a thousand photons and they take, you know, two or three out of that, no problem, you know, I still get it. And I think it is a one. I will never know if someone has, has if it's dropped. But with quanta, you cannot split a single photon. It's a quantum. You cannot, you know, divide it in, in smaller t particles. So it means that either it arrives and I can check if it arrives you know, in the right state or if it doesn't or if it is changed, I know. And this is this uh, sort of <coughs> uh, this sort of verification, which is down down here. I know that someone has listened. If the verification tells me, no, everything is fine. I am sure by the laws of nature that no one has listened to that. So I end up with this sequence of numbers, which is below, which is a key which I can use to encode messages. And this is really the basis of something which is in these devices, which I showed before, which you can actually buy and several banks and governments are using. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you something which maybe you have also, maybe some of you have already heard that or some colleagues of mine, of course, are aware of it, but most colleagues of mine do not know what I had actually in my right pocket, which I now took out of the pocket, and it is here. Okay, so this looks like, a, like a, a, a normal cell phone, and it almost is, but it has on the back, I don't know if you can see that, a word which is quantum. This is actually a device which uh, uh, enables something which was thought to be impossible, namely to make your kids think that their dad is finally cool, because this is the first consumer electronic device in human history, which is based on a quantum technology of the second quantum revolution. And it contains <coughs> a piece of a chip, which is essential for this uh, um, scheme, which I showed here, namely 
to choose randomly in in the beginning you know the bit sequence which you are sending uh, in such a way that only Alice knows it and nobody else can know it you need true randomness and the only way to achieve actual randomness is to use again a quantum device because I measure I make a measurement and what comes out of the measurement is completely random so this was <clears throat> started when the experiments were done 25 years ago it was something which would occupy a table the device to just generate these quantum numbers because it would be a photon which goes on a mirror and then a detector so all very big stuff now we have been able to <coughs> miniaturize this and make it very very small 2.5 millimeters square so that it is in the cell phone the bad news is that this is the samsung phone meaning that the idea is actually the chip is produced in europe and the money is made <clears throat> in South Korea. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we want with these ideas, which actually started in Europe, even in Germany. Most of quantum mechanics was developed in Germany. We want to make sure that this time also the value gets created there. And we need industry to, to be engaged to avoid something like happened with the World Wide Web, which was invented at CERN in Geneva. And the whole money was made actually in the US. So that's <clears throat> really something which is real now, but we want to make sure it will become uh, also something which gets in production and this is exactly what i was discussing in parliament because if i go back to the to the previous thing what was uh, um, between myself and and the rapporteur for this chips act the new law which they are doing for production of chips in europe is indeed this quantum computer and at the bottom of it there's this quantum chip i will explain to you in a moment what it does but really this is the connection between science and the sort of industrial aspect of, of that that i would like to to underscore here so this is for communication okay so let me go now forward <coughs> so the vision here is that we protect you know citizen data and we create an infrastructure at european level uh, which can do that both on terrestrial level and also on satellite level and uh, i will come back to that if i have time in my last slide there is a range of applications here which is not only encrypting messages but also creating you know you know not only the random quantum number generator which which uh, um, is uh, in this phone that i showed you but also connecting computers and in the end creating the basis for future quantum internet so this is quantum communication but of course a quantum internet you know oh sorry <clears throat> and uh, i should mention that we are doing it in in europe because a couple of years ago the chinese government did it not only with the satellite as is shown here and this is a picture of the actual device but also with you know uh, uh, terrestrial channels between beijing and shanghai in which you connect all of them with secure quantum channels and so we want to connect also all European capital cities with such secure quantum channels. And this is our European quantum communication infrastructure, which we are setting up now. Now, <clears throat> all member states of the European Union are collaborating with that. And I will give you a, a, a summary of that in, in the following slides. However, you know, the point of the internet, the internet, like we are using now, I have a computer and then there is a communication channel which connects it to your computers. So for Quantum internet, we need quantum communication, but also quantum computers. And what is a quantum computer? So this is a device which can give us very big computing power for a lot of problems, including optimization, including a possibly solution of problems in chemistry. That's quantum simulation. I'll come back to that in a moment, as well as artificial intelligence. But this is very long term. So at the moment, we don't have that. At the moment, we have very useless quantum computers, which are extremely exciting because they're useless. I will explain that in a moment. It seems strange here. <clears throat> but here is the first example from Intel, from the Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show in uh, um, 2018, I think. They're quantum chips with 9, 17 and 49 qubits. And how does that work? Let's imagine that I have a problem which is actually maybe a logistics problem like you know when when uh, you know some some dhl actually is uh, and the deutsche post is interested in these quantum computers because they have every morning they have to go out and give out some packages and they want to save um, uh, you know uh, money fuel and time so given some places you have to go to you, it is like orienting yourself in a labyrinth you have to find the proper way to get out in the minimum possible time so let's imagine that you're sitting in a labyrinth for simplicity and you want to get out. How do you do that? Well, you know, you go forward at some point, you have a bifurcation, you go left, you go right. Well, you have to try one. Okay. 
and you will go and then you follow some path at some point you get stuck then you come back you retrace your your steps and then you say okay that time i went right no let me go left this time okay and you can encode in computing terms each left or right like with zero and one so we have a sequence of left and right turns which is a sequence of zeros and ones that's my classical computer the quantum computer as i said my quantum bit can be zero and one at the same time so it means that when i am at one bifurcation i can with a quantum computer describe a situation in which i'm going left and right at the same time so if i have many of these quantum bits you know i can describe the whole sequence and in one go not just trying one after the other but just all in parallel in one go i will reach the exit just by <clears throat> using this parallelism in terms of exploring all possibilities at the same time unfortunately this is what the quantum computer will know so the quantum computer will know the solution but then we also we are humans we need to read it so we'll observe the quantum computer we will measure and as we said before it will collapse on one of many possibilities and maybe in this particular case we don't have a good quantum algorithm it means i can run the quantum computer but then i look at it and this may collapse on the wrong solution so i have to try again so in this case the quantum computer itself will know the right path but for me to get it i don't have a good quantum algorithm for doing that so that's what i have to develop new algorithms which can exploit this parallelism and you know being able to turn them in useful solutions and it is very difficult of course because a quantum computer is it is like you know keeping this quantum computer at the quantum level you know all this big thing which i showed to in the parliament yesterday and today is really and maybe my assistant will come now because i'm in the office in brussels and he, if he comes i will be able to to show it the real thing to you but in any case you know it has these different layers because it has to be very very cold next to zero temperature so it's a fridge because we have to isolate it because keeping the quantum computer alive and working is more difficult as one colleague put it than keeping a snowball in the middle of hell because the environment has a very high temperature compared to this uh, few nano kelvin in in a few milli kelvin or even nano kelvin if it is ion or atoms in which the, the the qubits are and so you really have to protect it it's very difficult and you have to correct for those errors but if you can do that what you can do is as i said optimization um also using for securing communications also for cracking codes because actually uh, um, a quantum computer can crack current cryptography codes and you can develop other applications and different kinds of software for also creating quantum networks in the perspective of the quantum internet now why did i say it's useless for oh sorry uh, um, uh, uh, you can buy this so this is something which I, ibm commercialized uh, at the consumer electronic show in las vegas in 2019 it fits in your living room it costs only a couple of um, dozen million dollars uh, and so you can get it uh, it has a few quantum bits not so many yet what it does can still be reproduced by you know your normal computer but uh, one and a half years ago google with this chip uh, it is a 53 qubits quantum chip so they solved in two and a half minutes with the 26 kilowatts of power so like a couple of, uh, uh, you know, like, um, I don't know, washing machines or, or uh, you know, or, uh, ironing boards. It, uh, it solved a problem in two and a half minutes, which the largest supercomputer on Earth at the time would take 10,000 years to compute with 14 megawatts. So the energy consumption is enormously different, unfortunately. And also the speed is, is very different. Now there are algorithms which can solve that in a few hours but still you know there is a, an enormous you know uh, uh, difference in, in the power that you consume unfortunately it is for a completely useless problem in the sense that this is a problem which is called sampling in a random distribution of unitary matrices if i had to explain it to you i would have to give you a three months course on quantum mechanics and i promise it is completely and utterly useless it was invented this problem just to show that the google chip you know can do it and the classical supercomputer cannot. Nevertheless, it is important. I will talk about that in a moment. Before I do that, I want to mention that maybe we start being a little bit disappointed because those are all uh, American companies. But the flagship, our European program, which started, uh, which started three years ago and just concluded the first ramp-up phase um, with a review meeting a few weeks ago in Paris, 
we managed to get them. Quantum computers. So there is this company, Pascal, which is commercializing a quantum computer, uh, more specialized, a quantum simulator. I'll come back to that in a moment. With 150 qubits, they are selling them. I get the, I, I managed to convince them. I got the first, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, Mengenrabatt for quantum computers, because I managed to convince the CEO to sell me two quantum computers for the price of one. Okay. So that, uh, you know, in, in the first pilot projects in which we are going to put this on supercomputing centers, we are having one in Paris and the other one is coming to Germany, to Jülich. Okay. So that we are going to use it for enhancing the supercomputer that, that we have there. So, this is about what Google did, okay? Essentially, it is 200 seconds versus 10 to the 4 years versus 10,000 years on a high-performance computer, but on a fully useless problem. It's like the uh, Wright's brother um, flight. It's something which, uh, you know, I can carry my shopping, my grocery bags, you know, for, you know, at one meter from, 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 from the ground for, you know, like 50 or 100 meters, much more easily than having to build an airplane. But of course, I don't have to convince you that, you know, demonstrating that, even though it was not useful per se, has been opening some very important possibilities. So we are at a similar moment. A quantum computer which does not do yet anything practical, but shows that this is possible to go beyond what normal machines can do. And in fact, in the Chinese Academy of Sciences, with a different kind of quantum processor, a photonic quantum processor, they were able to do in 200 seconds something which on the supercomputer would take 2.5 billion years. So really, and this is because, why? Because Google had 53 qubits, they have 66, and the scaling is exponential. Like if I have 53 qubits, I put one qubit more, putting one qubit more, Exponential scaling means that with one qubit more, it becomes twice as powerful. And two qubits more, four times as powerful. So with 55 qubits is four times as powerful than with 53. And with 56 uh, uh, qubits is eight times as powerful and so on and so forth. So you go to 66 qubits and then you see why you have this big advantage. But of course, it is not yet something practical, but just a demonstration that you can actually build these machines. And something which might be more practical, actually, in our review meeting, which I mentioned last week in Paris, we already had the first claim of practical quantum advantage with quantum simulators. So this is a slide which is very dear to me because it is for, from um, five years ago. And I showed it when I had 15 minutes and eight slides to show to Commissioner Oettinger to convince him to give us the first billion for the quantum flagship. So it's a slide which is very valuable for me, at least uh, uh, emotionally, let's say. And it's also valuable because it shows a result which was taken with copy and paste from Science magazine, um, from a paper by my colleague Emmanuel Bloch from Munich, in which for the first time, and this was 10 years ago, he showed a quantum simulator based on, in this case, individual atoms in an optical, in a laser field. Um, these individual atoms, what can they do? They can reproduce, they can be put in a, in a structure which is reproducing some quantum material. So, and instead of the atoms in the real material, like in a crystal or in, in some piece of matter, you put the atoms and you can control them and engineer them in this laser field. And then you can calculate with that what would be the magnetization of such a material if you start by you know kicking it with some initial field or something like that. So this blue dot is what the quantum simulator gives you. And the black line is what the supercomputer at the time, the most powerful in Europe, in Jülich, was able to compute. Up to a certain point, you see, they give the same result. And then after that, there are a few oscillations. So it's a first tiny indication, but it's kind of has historic value. Now we have much more clear indications of the fact that the quantum computer is going beyond what the classical supercomputer can do. And what can you use it for? Well, uh, you see here a, a slightly bigger picture of those atoms that you have there. And you can use it to design new chemicals and new materials. Why? Because we know molecules are made out of atoms, but calculating their behavior is very, very difficult. If now I'm able to reproduce the behavior by putting together those atoms in a controlled way in my uh, quantum simulator, I may calculate what is the structure, for instance, what are properties of these uh, uh, chemicals or materials um, by 
uh, directly seeing what the quantum simulator is doing. Yeah. So there are applications of this in chemistry, in nuclear physics, in material sciences, and also, for instance, Volkswagen uh, was using uh, a quantum, a specific type of quantum simulator from a quantum annealer, so-called, from a Canadian company, D-Wave, and we have now one of these machines installed in Ulich, and people can use it. We have an infrastructure called Unique, with J, J U N I Q, Ulich Unified Infrastructure for Quantum Computing. Uh, which everybody can access and develop new problems and, and uh, understand and, and attack new problems. So these are examples of what a quantum simulator can do. Now, the last but not least aspect I want to mention is quantum sensing. It was one of the uh, um, things that I mentioned before, and I did say that um, it can be relevant, for instance, in the, in the life sciences context, um, here is uh, um, an example of medical diagnostics that you can do. Okay, so uh, here you have this uh, is an experiment that was done in vitro, not yet in vivo. In vitro, single uh, a, a single planar neuronal sample was measured in real time as it was firing by putting it on a on a on a substrate of diamond. In diamond, you can have single electrons trapped in so-called color centers. There are defects in diamond. Diamond is not always white. Sometimes it's colored because there may be defects. So it's not like completely uniform, just carbon, but some other material. For instance, in this case, nitrogen vacancy. So it's a carbon atom which is missing in the crystal and the nitrogen atom which is replacing it. And this you can gives you an electron which you can manipulate. And it is even quantum. It behaves with quantum properties even at room temperature. So you can use it in biosciences. This has been used to detect um, uh, 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 cell activity at a resolution which is impossible with, with a microscope and in real time. So this is something which uh, really has a lot of applications in neuroscience, in, in, uh, molecular bi in, in, sorry, in cellular biology and so on. And there are companies already which are producing and commercializing uh, devices doing that. And there is a pilot project by the um, company Bosch a pilot project in the German National Program for Quantum Technologies in which they are really developing a helmet which is equipped with such quantum sensors to detect first sense of brain activity to get you know some uh, human machine interface for instance for lock patients with lock-in syndrome that they can communicate just by 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 their thought and of course this is you know at the moment very futuristic but it is not something which is science fiction and big companies are working on that we have another example here uh, of a gravimeter, which is developed by a French company, Muquans, again, a startup of some of our uh, European projects, um, which uh, is able to detect gravitational field, for instance, for finding geological resources or for high precision measurements. So these are just two examples of many possibilities. Another one which is, is positioning, because satellites, when you sit in your car, you have a navigator and then this thing is getting signals from some satellite and you get three signals from three satellites the one satellite beeps beep 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 and the other satellite is a little bit farther away beeps beep beep and so by knowing how far you are from three satellites you know your position however the precision with which you know where you are as you know it's a few meters, you know, this is what the precision which, which, uh, which your, you know, your cell phone or your car navigator is giving you. Why? This is limited because the beeping signal, which come from the satellite, have only a certain uh, uh, precision, certain accuracy. So if you can enhance that, if you can measure time more precisely, you can get more precise navigation. And this is exactly what is being developed because with quantum entanglement, you can measure time much more precisely and you can get to position precision, which can go from a few meters to a few centimeters or maybe millimeters, which maybe is relevant also for autonomous driving. So this is just one example of quantum measurement, which can be really used in everyday life. And there are other examples like pressure uh, fields, magnetic fields are very relevant. As, as we mentioned, this is how we measure individual neurons. Microscopy, spectroscopy, those are all things which are very relevant for the life sciences. Yeah. So <clears throat> essentially, you know, here is a summary of the different areas that we have, and we are going towards the infrastructure dimension. So uh, I don't know if I was supposed to have uh, like 45 minutes and then questions, in which case we would be over, 
or if I have a couple more minutes, we, I can stop here if you wish, or, and maybe also answering some questions, I can explain, if you wish, what we do in terms of infrastructure, where we take these technologies and we really bring them for the benefit of society. But maybe this is a good moment, perhaps, to interrupt and to, to get if there are any questions on, on this. So, thank you for your attention, of course. And uh, I hope that uh, I was able sort of to, to uh, sort of not lose you uh, in, in explaining a little bit of the ideas um, in terms which uh, should not be too specialized at this stage. I, I think it was great. And I think we can uh, maybe continue. We have one full hour, but maybe we can use the last couple of minutes for, uh, for the slides you mentioned. Um, and, and let's see if there's questions right now. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see if there are questions right now, and then in the end, if we have time, I can show the, the rest. So, could you comment on? Uh, I mean, more it's more a political question. Where where do you see Germany, or more generally Europe, globally in this whole field? Uh, yeah, what's your what's your view? Maybe not just now, but also in the coming 10, 20 years. Yes, and I, I could start from three years ago and, you know, sort of <clears throat> painted the trajectory and also the reason for optimism, because I could tell you, oh, in 20 years, uh, the future is bright, but I need some reason for doing that. And so I can argue for that if we start from a couple of years ago. So when we started the so-called ramp up phase of the flagship three years ago, we had zero startups in Europe, uh, zero companies producing quantum computers. And we had at the research level, you know, a, a significant delay with respect to such companies as Google, which invested a lot of money and went on really full speed towards some specific technologies such as superconducting qubits. And now what we see uh, uh, three years after is that we have this machine, which I showed in Parliament today, which I, I, I showed you the picture. We have startups producing in Europe uh, uh, quantum computers with superconducting qubits. There is one in Finland with ions, there is one in Austria. I showed the one with atoms, which is in France. So this really grew out of the projects that we have developed in such a way that on superconducting qubits, we are catching up the delay that we had. Initially, it was a delay of about, let's say, two and a half years. Now it's more a delay of about one year, if you wish, with respect to what the US are doing. Um, in other fields of quantum simulation, uh, we are world leading. Because what I showed you, so what is happening in Munich is defining the state of the art in Munich and in Paris, defining the state of the art worldwide. So we are ahead with quantum computing with ions. We are kind of, uh, you know, on par with the US. So Honeywell now has a big effort uh, um, on ion trap quantum computing and the, our startup in Austria is really competing with them on quantum sensing. With this diamond of the technology, which I showed, especially for biomedical applications, we are world leading again. There's another group in Harvard doing things, another uh, um, company, but really the bulk of what we are doing is in Europe. China is uh, sort of catching up in the sense that they have a lot of, uh, you know, Chinese uh, uh, postdocs and students which are coming and, and joining us on the scientific side. And then, of course, they acquire competence and there is substantial support in their country because they are also investing a lot, actually much more than, than, uh, than uh, well, not much more in the meantime. So the, uh, China is investing on the order of 10 million, 10 billions and the quantum flagship, which was supposed to be 1 billion over 10 years, now grew to 7.5 billions. So it's kind of comparable to China. Uh, <clears throat> and well, essentially, they with this big uh, investment and with the very bright minds that, of course, they have and, and uh, several of them are working in our labs, they are managing also to, to catch up. But still, I would say that, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, Europe is among the three biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, players. And the goal for our flagship by 2027 is that Europe is among the two world leading economies based on quantum. So and we can be very optimistic because, in fact, you know, everything that we promised in our research agenda three years ago has been now achieved. And so this is really <coughs> moving forward in a, in, a, in a very nice way. So we don't have to <coughs> worry that we remain, uh, you know, back. But of course, we have to keep the, the, the investment and also the engagement with the different users, which is one of the reasons why Apart from our conversation with 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 the, with the, with the, with the uh, you know German te radio television, uh, uh, and, uh, one additional reason why it is so very interesting for me to be discussing today is that 
it's very important to engage with users and different people who can make use of these technologies in different fields. So the biosciences is, of course, a very, very important uh, application field there. Yeah, that's very encouraging and actually also a good transition to the next question in the chat, which is how can we leverage the power of quantum computing technologies in the field of biomedical engineering? So what's your thoughts on this? So <clears throat> the main uh, um, the main aspect, so if we now focus uh, away from quantum sensing and more in, in um, quantum computing, I would say in quantum computing and simulation, we can leverage it a lot in perspective towards uh, uh, chemistry better understanding of chemical processes and and this is maybe a dream for in 20 years let's say uh, you know development of like drug design like an aid in drug design now i say visionary 15 20 years because as a scientist i like to sort of de-hype as much as i can i can tell you that there is a, a, a department at bayer with a couple dozen people which is already now working on use cases for using quantum computers and quantum simulators, quantum simulators to sort of enhance drug design. And they have use cases which they actually want to test on our infrastructure in Ulich. So it might come earlier than that, but honestly, I very much prefer to say it will take a long time and then be surprised, like actually it happened in the last three years with the, with the flagship, then, you know, over-promising and under-delivering. So that's a, that's a very important aspect, expectation management. So in the biosciences, quantum computing and simulation, very clear path toward, you know, better understanding chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, you know, we have to be careful that this is something really for the mid to long term. Okay, um, we have two questions from Marco Hübner. Maybe you want to look at them. They're long, so you. So let me check in the chat. Okay. I can also read out if you prefer. But... Are squids still state of the art in terms of qubits at level? Uh, uh, well, um, I would say that <clears throat> uh, at the moment, uh, ion traps and laser atom uh, ion traps uh, are on par with the uh, superconducting qubits and atoms uh, are actually uh, have had a, a, an evolution in the last three years if you had asked me at the beginning of the flagship i would have said you know atoms you know maybe it's kind of futuristic who knows but now you know actually this startup pascal which is commercializing this quantum simulator really came out uh, uh, and had a very very steep uh, improvement over the last few years yeah so i would say that uh, uh, superconducting qubits are certainly not uh, leading but they are up they are leading among other platforms but they are not the only one yeah and uh, ions and atoms are at least as strong so the second uh, um, question was what is the range yeah the range so i spoke about you when i i showed you this uh, uh, beijing to shanghai communication line it was a segment. It was not just one from Beijing to Shanghai. Why? Because if you send these photons over optical fibers, glass fibers, then they get absorbed at some point. So it can reach the record is now a few hundred kilometers. So we need either for longer distances, either a, a satellite, as the Chinese have done, because, you know, there it goes through space, it's empty, and so it can carry longer distances, or it should be something in which you put a quantum repeater, which is a small quantum computer, which sort of uh, creates this entanglement at a longer distance, which you can then use for the quantum communication. So this is something which is an active area of research. And the idea is that it should be placed, now we are creating a European quantum communication infrastructure that was one of the most, my last two slides, but I can just say the content <coughs> in words. Um, we are creating <clears throat> nodes of a quantum internet in all European capital cities. And so we can have point to point, like I can go from Paris to Brussels and from Brussels to, to, to um, whatever, to, to, to Amsterdam, but going directly from Paris to Amsterdam, that would be more difficult. I would need a quantum repeater in Brussels. Once we do that, it doesn't matter who operates them because you can verify independently that the quantum repeater works and if it works no one can listen because i can verify then directly between paris and amsterdam that my quantum signal is secure so i can have 
in the end, a quantum communication, which is so-called device independent, in the sense that with a quantum repeater, I can make sure that it bridges longer distances, and then I can be, again, perfectly safe. And now there is another question about AI. Okay, and Marco Hümner is happy about my answers, which makes me happy in turn. And then um, uh, Nico Dish asks uh, about AI. How could quantum computing improve AI research? Um, uh, well, there is a general answer, which is AI is based on finding the minimum <coughs> of a function, a complex function on a neural network. So, and we know that quantum computers, in particular quantum annealers, which are kind of quantum simulators, but also, you know, there are algorithms in quantum computing for finding minima of functions. And so this is the general idea. Now, how specifically does it work for specific problems, which is connected also to the, the other part of the question, how do we design quantum algorithms? That depends on the specific problem, and we do not yet have a general theory. In classical software, we have software engineering, so there is a problem, there is a very clear way how you can, you know, break it up and encode it on a computer. In quantum computing, that's the big question. This is why the computer that we have from Google, as I said before, is useless. And actually, the big nightmare of the head of Google, uh, uh, who, by the way, is a German guy, very nice, nice guy, Hartmut Neven, he says, I have a nightmare, I wake up one day, and we have a universal fully functional quantum computer, and we have no clue what to do with it. In the sense that, you know, we need really algorithms for specific problems. That's the current challenge. This is where industry is engaging, and we see progress, which is coming up, and they have very specific problems. I mean, one problem which was mentioned was, was striking me for it's completely, for me, exotic nature, but it is very practical. There was um, the company Trumpf uh, at the laser uh, affair in Munich, at our quantum messe um, and uh, they were they are both investing in quantum technologies but also they have a problem which they are trying to solve with the quantum computer which is the following they have a laser they have a sheet of metal and from this sheet of metal maybe it is a rectangle rectangular <coughs> piece of metal and then they want to cut out uh, i don't know uh, uh, some circular shapes okay or some specific shapes so how do they you know do that with the laser by cutting out uh, in, in the way that they can, they can get most shapes and the least material which is discarded, okay? Which is like, you know, a problem which you may have as a child if you are doing some bricolage with, some, 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 with your scissors. And this is a, a problem which is very practical, which brings value to them because they have to throw away less of this precious material which, which they are, uh, you know, processing. But it is something which would never occur to a physicist, as a matter of fact. But they say, already with quantum computers with not so many qubits, they are starting to try to, to attack uh, these problems. So this shows you that, you know, which uh, and how do we design a quantum algorithm for some practical quantum advantage? It really depends on the problem. And this is really something which can be uh, um, dealt with uh, in, a, in a practical situation. And specifically use cases, this is exactly what we are going into in terms of what we try to, 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 to achieve with this new infrastructure for quantum computing and simulation, which you are preparing. That was my other slide, but essentially, uh, I, I already told you, we are trying to put together quantum computers as coprocessors next to supercomputers and give access to everybody to develop new ideas and to find out how can we play with this, how can we design new algorithms. And I hope that is also an answer to the question by Nico Dish. And he seems to be happy, so that's very nice. <coughs> very interesting, and also we're perfectly on time. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. It was very enlightening for me personally. I think also the audience uh, liked it according to the reactions we saw. Thank you so much, and I hand over to Doreen for the closing. Yes, <laughs> no more words needed. Thank you very much for this great talk. And yeah, thank you to Lena, thank you to the audience. And um, yeah, would be happy to have a lot of clicks on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Wonderful. Goodbye to you. Bye.